Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you all for coming this afternoon. My name is Katherine Schneider. I'll be uh, introducing Dr. Mewissa today. And uh, it's my great pleasure to have this opportunity um, to introduce um, Dr. Mewissa as I have had the opportunity to actually be taught by Dr. Mewissa in 1994 when I took uh, kinesiology 490 along with Dr. Brent Hagel. And uh, it was a fantastic class and I think certainly inspired a lot of us to then continue on in an academic career. So um, definitely has had the opportunity. Um, he has inspired many undergraduate, graduate students, mentored many physicians, physiotherapists, had a large impact on many people's lives throughout the course of his career. And we're gonna get to hear a lot about that here today. So certainly he's been an active and uh, wonderful faculty member within the Faculty of Kinesiology for the last 25 years. Um, and um, many of us in this room have had the opportunity to take a class for him, from him, to hear him speak, um, and he truly is a motivating and inspiring speaker. He's also been uh, involved uh, in the Sport Medicine Center as a sport medicine physician and a leading sport um, injury epidemiologist and uh, was the director of the Sport Medicine Center as well. He's also the co-chair of the Sport Injury Prevention Research Center, um, which was founded in 2005, um, it, along with uh, Dr. Carolyn Emery, and certainly has really led our research group um, and ha has really gotten to see the, the group grow and develop over the course of the years under his leadership. And actually the Sport Injury Prevention Research Center is one of the initial four International Olympic Committee Centers um, for the Prevention of Illness and Injury in Athletes recognized um, by the IOC. He's also a very good curler, as we found out when we did some of our um, team bonding events when we had a postdoctoral fellow here from Norway um, and his team did win the curling bond spiel. And he was also the editor in chief for the Clinical Journal of Sport Medicine for 14 years. He's also been a valued faculty member, colleague um, to many people within the Faculty of Kinesiology, many different accolades um, that uh, we could go on for an hour, but I have three minutes here, so I'll be very brief, but certainly um, has had a big impact on the Faculty of Kinesiology um, and in, in impacting the research of many. He's also had an impact not only locally within the University of Calgary, but also nationally um, with some of the work that he's done in the area of concussion and injury prevention, um, as well as with the International Olympic Committee, both from an epidemiology and academic standpoint, as well as from a clinical standpoint. Um, and he was instrumental in bringing the International Olympic Committee um, team physician um, course here to Calgary for the last two years as well. Um, he's also led the concussion and sport group since its um, inception in 2001. He's been a co-lead of this group that certainly had a large impact on changing practice and changing the way that we assess and treat concussions and also brought the research agenda forward. And we've certainly seen a lot of um, impact into clinical practice as well as into the research. Um, and so he's definitely done a great job here leading us and most recently um, in Berlin for the fifth consensus conference on concussion and sport. And so you can see him here front and center and actually getting a group of leading world experts to come to consensus in a difficult area is definitely a feat. Um, and uh, he's done a phenomenal <laughs> job of this. Also been very, very instrumental with the IOC um, and the uh, World Conference on the Prevention of Illness and Injury in Sport. So had a large impact locally for many of our lives, um, as well as throughout the university, um, nationally and internationally. So I look forward to hearing his talk today and thank him for all of the work that he's done with all of us here in this room. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. Is this on? It is. Now is it on? It's on. Okay, good. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. This is uh, the end of a 26-year career here. It's actually the first time I've lectured in front of my family, uh, though. So, so this you, you can still do new things after 26 years. 
Uh, I especially want to thank my parents who surprised me by flying out from uh, Ontario here yesterday, Savannah and Marianne, uh, who are here. Um, and they're a large part of the reason I'm here, well, biologically, obviously. But, um, I grew up with parents who told me you can do anything you put your mind to, um, and that's been something that's inspired me to do a lot of smart and not so smart things in my life. Um, but uh, it certainly has been a part of why I'm here and have done what I've done. So I thought I'd take you on a bit of a journey. Uh, this is more of a, a story than an academic lecture. Um, where I began academically, and I was at the University of Western Ontario, now Western University. I was fortunate to have some very good mentors uh, in Peter Fowler and Rich Hawkins uh, at Western uh, for my clinical training. Uh, these guys were really pioneers in their field. Uh, really got me interested in the whole area of sport medicine clinically. And then uh, when I finished medical school, there was this choice of, well, what do I do? Um, and there was a few areas that I was interested in from obstetrics to emerge to orthopedics to sport medicine. Uh, so Mary Beth and I took a trip to the East Coast. Here we are watching the sunrise in Bar Harbor, Maine in 1986, I think, seven. Um, trying to decide what to do. And, and at the end of the day, I chose to do sport medicine for a specific reason, and as I wanted to be a pioneer in something. Um, and I could, I could have definitely done some of those other areas and liked it, um, but this was a chance to do something unique. So uh, from Western, went to UBC, and again, had fantastic mentors in Jack Taunton and Doug Clement, um, and did my master's, believe it or not, in exercise physiology with Don McKenzie there, um, who was also a fantastic mentor, and really got me started at that time, I wasn't really considering academics, but these guys inspired me to, to pursue research because it's, it's such a young field. We need people developing new knowledge um, and kind of uh, was a natural progression from there. And then the timing of it, um, having had such great mentorship to start with, was that really it set us on a journey, um, my daughter Kellyanne in Hawaii, um, of where we would go um, as a young couple with no kids um, to, to have an impact in this field of sport medicine. And the timing of it then was that Calgary just had the Olympics and Roger Jackson had the foresight um, to, as part of the Olympic legacy, establish a sport medicine center. And uh, he was the reason I came here. Um, the whole center was just beginning and uh, he had not just the foresight to develop a, a clinic, but a center that with the financial support of John Simpson, allowed me to get startup funds to get going and actually began a PhD at the same time that I was doing my clinical practice and working in the faculty. Um, so it was a bit of a busy time. And the other person that was in instrumental who we unfortunately lost last year was Cy Frank, who was really the clinical inspiration um, to drive the research program along with Roger's vision. So these people are responsible for a lot of what you'll see for the rest of this talk. And we started a family, um, and I'll, I'll just introduce uh, Derek <laughs> and Kellyanne and Corey and Caitlin and her husband Graham and his brother Ian. <laughs> We're all here. And uh, this was a, it was a fun time with a young family developing new things. Uh, and I especially want to thank Mary Beth. Um, she hates being acknowledged publicly, so she won't like this, but um, I can't thank all those people without thanking her, my partner, my soulmate. Um, it's said that behind every mediocre man is a great woman, um, and those who know Mary Beth and know me will know that she's been... <laughs> If I've done anything good, it's because of her support. <laughs> so you saw this picture. Um, I have a little bit different color hair. Preston has a little bit more hair. <laughs> um, and we started this journey of, well, what about a clinical research integrated program here that um, in a way was unique, especially at this time in Canada. And sport medicine was a pretty young field. People didn't know how to look after injured athletes very well at that time. <laughs> That's actually Preston with a lot more hair on the left. <laughs> <way. laughs> 
So we didn't know a lot about injuries. It was 1993. So for those of you who are a little bit younger, this is like pre-internet, pre-cell phone, pre-everything. So collecting injury data was done on paper. And we established the Sport Injury Epidemiology Research Group. And the first employee was Dr. Brent Hagel. So it was a center of two people. Uh, that's a group. Uh, and then um, we had some notable graduate students. Brian Benson started in 1905. Um, and then, uh, sorry, 96 right after Brent. And then Carolyn Emery in 97. And then Catherine um, a bit later. So there's four people in the room. Um, but Catherine mentioned already I had her as an undergrad student um, even earlier than that. So. We have some other people in the room here who have a bit of a history. So why prevention? Um, why? Because injuries are not accidents, and there's a lot of them. They're predictable, and if they're predictable, then they should be preventable. So that's the basic idea that we started with. So what I'd like to do with our time here is just run through sort of three sections. One will talk about a change in thinking. Uh, now that we'll talk about some projects, and then I'll finish with some personal reflections. So Henry David Thoreau said, how can we remember our ignorance, which our growth requires, when we're using our knowledge all the time? And, and I like this quote because we're really, a lot of the time, focused a lot on knowledge, and not so much about thinking. And that's important because when you're working in the details of science on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes uh, we're so busy looking at the detail and figuring out well, what's right in front of us that we kind of don't see the big picture and realize that maybe the ride we're on is a little bit larger than what we see at the beginning. Maybe it's a lot larger. <laughs> He does survive. <laughs> so what do you see on the screen here? A bunch of dots. Right? And uh, when we're doing research, we look at things and we might say, well, that's some data. And if you pull back a little bit more, you might say, well, those data represent something, maybe a pattern. And if you pull back a bit further, you get a picture. How many people have seen this before? How many people see the old lady? How many people see the young lady? How many people can see both? Wow, that's impressive. So one of the reasons I think this is an old but interesting illustration is that we tend to see what we know. Uh, we look for familiar things, but we're not always open-minded to different ways of looking at things. So those of you who see the young lady would be surprised to see this picture uh, coming out of these data. Those of you who see the old lady would be surprised to see this picture coming out of the same data because it's actually the same data. And we go to conferences, we make presentations, we have academic debates about what's in the middle here because one of us might have the left point of view and one of them might have the right point of view. And really what we're talking about is a difference in interpretation of the same thing. And we're trying to find truth, and we're trying to communicate and understand the nature of the science, which is really the data we collect uh, in our different areas and our different disciplines. So the big idea, I think, is that how we think about things is often more important than what we think. What we think changes a lot. So, one of the, the things that I did early in, in my publishing um, actually came from my candidacy exam. So if you've ever done one uh, or you're about to do one, uh, you'll know what this involves. But it's, in, at the time I did it, it was a, there was no choice in how you did it. It was a three-week exam. You had four questions given to you, and you had three weeks to write a 20-page paper on each, on each question. And one of the questions was, well, how do you get at the cause of sport injuries? Simple question. Um, and it led to the development of an idea um, that I've published in 1994, looking at why athletes get hurt. And, and the idea is that you can take any given person with a set of what we call intrinsic risk factors, so characteristics the person has internally, 
could be how old they are, could be how flexible they are, could be their body type, could be anything. And then you have them play sport where they get exposed to extrinsic risk factors. It might be the surface that they're playing on or their footwear or their protective equipment or the rules of the game or whatever. And that transitions from predisposing somebody on the basis of what they have internally to being susceptible once it gets combined with the extrinsic or the external factors. And then really all of those things are distant from the outcome. They all happen before there's any actual event. But then something does happen, there's an inciting event, and you get an injury that's produced. And at this point, a lot of the research is really focused on the mechanisms of the injury, all of these things here, not so much on why some people get hurt and some people don't. So that was in 1994, and because of publishing this part of my candidacy exam thing, um, led to uh, other projects and people contacting me and establishing collaborations, which has been, I'd say, in my career, a really important uh, aspect of developing a program. So when we're trying to look at injury causes, we look at, well, which, which factors are associated with a higher rate of injury? Um, are they actually the cause of the injury, which is a different question, and then can you change them? Are they modifiable? And I like this quote from over 100 years ago from George Bernard Shaw, because it kind of illustrates the concept. Thus it is easy to prove that the wearing of tall hats and the carrying of umbrellas enlarges the chest, prolongs life, and confers comparative immunity from disease, for the statistics show that the classes which use these are bigger, healthier, and live longer than the classes which never dream of such things. So the scientist would say that all you need to do is get a hat and an umbrella, and you're good to go, right? Now, the reality is that carrying a, an umbrella, wearing a hat, is a predictor of longevity. But it's probably not the cause of the longevity. It's the fact that you can take the umbrella and the hat away, and if the person still is from a higher social economic class, they're probably going to live longer. So that's why it's important. You can still use the hat and the umbrella to predict the injury, but removing it doesn't prevent the, the injury or doesn't change the outcome. And ridiculous examples are always nice because they're simple and I like simple. But when you're trying to look at a whole environment of the athletes, it's not so simple to, to, to tease that out. So the question is, do you see things more clearly? Well, maybe. Um, Einstein is, quoted, is uh, credited as saying, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. So this kind of thinking um, may help us thinking about this as a system instead of isolated pieces. But there are problems with that approach too. One issue is that you can't just have something like poor flexibility. You actually have to have it and participate with it in order to have and have an effect on your injuries. Um, athletes can be exposed in many different ways repeatedly. They practice many times and they play sports many times. And they may or may not change their participation because of injury. So a start to finish linear approach probably doesn't make sense, really. So the, the, the thinking evolved in, in this model, which has really driven a lot of our research around the fact that this doesn't really capture at all. Really, there's many, many times that people participate without actually having an event that produces an injury. And Although some people have an injury, don't recover and stop participating in sport, many more people will actually recover and go back to participate. They'll participate without an injury and keep going, but they might adapt. They'll keep participating, they'll keep cycling through this model every time they get exposed. So an example of this would be, for example, let's say for argument's sake that if you're stronger, you have a lower injury risk. So strength is good. And if you play hockey and do body contact and you get exposed to body contact, two things can happen. Either you can have breakdown and weakness or you actually can have tissue stimulation and strengthening and you actually improve the system. So therefore, um, that's better, you get stronger. So you can adapt and decrease your risk or you can maladapt or non-adapt and increase your risk. So, you're being exposed to the same thing, you're responding in a different way, and those things may produce a different outcome. So the outcomes that you can have is you can have no injury, 
you can have an injury and retire or be removed. You can recover and have repeat participation partially or fully. Uh, and you can therefore continually adapt or maladapt. And one of the more interesting things that I think needs a lot more study, especially people in the HPL here, is why people don't get injured. So we study these mechanisms of injury all the time. This happened, we get a video of it, and we calculate the forces, but what about all the forces the athletes go through all the time and don't have an injury? Well, why does that occur? And if we can answer that, I think we'll also have a much better answer about prevention because a lot of things happen repeatedly without a bad outcome. What's the difference between the mechanism of injury and the mechanism of no injury? So the take-home point from all these models is that I think what we've learned over the years is that we do have these risk factors that are sport specific, but there's a lot of interaction going on which increase or decrease your chance of injury. And it happens dynamically and recursively, and, and there's a change over time with repeat participation. So that's kind of the theoretical background. And if we go back to how we think then, this quote from Elliot about not ceasing from exploration and coming back to the same place and knowing it for the first time, it's possible to look at some of the same factors that we've been studying for years, but look at them in a different way and maybe come to a different conclusion. And really where this field is going next, I think, um, has been illustrated in a, in a paper that was just published this past year. I'm on Natalia Bittencourt, who's a, a physiotherapist, PhD, that was here from um, Brazil. I spent three months with our group. Um, looking at complex systems. So using the same kind of analysis that are used in financial systems, um, where you have a number of different changing factors, using complexity theory to pick out, instead of a factor, plus or minus another factor, actually looking at, at systems and, and pattern recognition. The more important part of Natalia's work is that when she was here from Brazil, she saw a moose in our backyard. <laughs> And if you ask her what the most important thing she got out of our time here was not the complexity theory model, it was the moose. <laughs> so do we start out confused and end up confused on a higher level? I'd say that's education, right? That's why we're here. So in the context of those models and that way of thinking, we formed this uh, injury prevention research group um, that really, as I said, was started in 93, became formally a, a center of excellence recognized by the IOC in 2008. And we've grown from two people to, I think, last count was 48 staff, students, and uh, postdoctoral fellows and research assistants and coordinators, and many of who are in this room. Um, so it's been a fantastic journey that way. So what I'd like to do is just share with you a few of the, a few of the projects that we've, we've been doing um, over the last few years, um, just to give you a bit of a, a flavor. Uh, covering a whole bunch of sports from elite athletes, rodeo, uh, professional hockey, soccer, ski snowboard, um, concussion consensus and youth ice hockey, and this won't take that long. <laughs> so uh, one of the earlier projects we did was actually with the Canadian Athlete Monitoring Program, and this was a, an attempt to get an electronic medical record in place for the, for the national teams where we could do injury surveillance electronically. I think it was Bill Richardson built our program in Fox Base Mac or Fox Pro or something like that. So um, this was the beginning of things, I think it was 94 that we first started this project um, and became uh, something that, that was used over the years, but it really allowed us for the first time to mine data from an electronic system used for epidemiology. Um, there are other projects that came out of that, looking at things like sleep <coughs> screening programs, uh, developing validated questionnaires for the elite athletes. Um, I was also working as a doctor for the cross-country ski team at the time, so that was a good fit. Uh, there was a work that Dale Butterwick really was a pioneer in that we, we did together, um, setting up a, a system to study rodeo injuries, and, and we actually didn't study, strictly speaking, the cowboys, we studied the livestock. Because we couldn't get money to study the cowboys, but we could get money from the animal rights activists to study the animals. And then while we did that, we piggybacked, if you pardon the pun, um, the, <laughs> the cowboys on the livestock, so that we could measure both, actually. And Dale established the catastrophic injury registry, which is still running today, looking at, at more serious injury uh, with chest injuries and head injuries in, in pro rodeo. Um, so that was also sort of a, a, a new thing at that time and, and a new way of getting money. So think about that one. If you can't get any money, go for the animals. <laughs> um, I also started as a team doctor with the Calgary Flames in 1995. Um, that's not real. Um, 
and uh, and still work with them today. But it was a it was another opportunity um, to establish something new. There was no real research going on in the NHL at that time, um, but we established a way of measuring injuries. And Carolyn Emery, actually, her master's project was looking at groin injuries in the NHL. Uh, Brian Benson then started a project looking at concussions. And Paul Eliason is currently doing his work uh, in epidemiology in his PhD looking at protective equipment. P Paul's been a real pioneer because he's come up with a new method of testing protective equipment that, um, that we're looking for volunteers for at the moment. <laughs> So we are innovative. Uh, really, the, the shift over time with the Sport Injury Prevention Group has really been focused. We are known for one thing, it's, it's injury prevention in youth. And even amongst the other research centers in the world, uh, that would be our niche. And so that really started with soccer. And I won't take credit for that because really it's been driven primarily by Carolyn Emery um, leading our team. Brent uh, Hagel and Kelly Russell have been doing a lot of fantastic work in, in, in snowboard and ski injuries and train park injuries. So a lot of the things that we have now is policies around helmet use, um, lighting in the train parks, uh, and safety measures are a direct result of their work that we've done in collaboration. <clears throat> and probably the one that's had the biggest impact is the hockey body checking question, which became a national um, issue around looking at injury rate differences in, in the different age groups of, of, of hockey. And the study that Carolyn really helped drive, showed a four-fold increase in concussion if you allow body checking in Pee Wee, which is age 11 and 12, compared to if there's no body checking. And, and it was a very interesting sociologic experiment too because when we found a difference, it took a bit of time to actually produce a policy change because of differences in jurisdiction between city leagues and provincial leagues and national organizations. But this work really tipped the scale um, and now is part of a national policy about how body checking gets introduced to different age groups and different levels of hockey. And if you actually translate all those graphs and numbers into something real, about 600 concussions per year in Alberta and about 5,000 concussions per year in Canada reduction because of the change in policy. So that's a pretty big impact. The other thing that Catherine mentioned briefly that we've had a chance to be part of is the concussion and sport group which is which has uh, been an interesting journey because when we started this in 2001 there was a bunch of people i was a journal editor then and had some nhl data that i presented at this meeting and there was another journal editor from the british journal and we had this meeting and said you know this is kind of a new area we should publish something on this and so we produced an agreement statement and that was the beginning of this thing um and we decided, well, it's a changing field. We should have another conference. Let's do it in three or four years. So we had a meeting in Prague and wrote another agreement statement that, again, was, was pretty informal. And we thought, well, we don't really know how people should measure this injury. Let's come up with a tool. Um, it was not done in a structured or very scientific way. It was just looking at other validated instruments and trying to combine them. And that gave birth to the sport concussion assessment tool, which now is a pretty widespread tool. But if I try and pretend that I knew what I was doing at the beginning, I'd be lying because I didn't. It was just, well, it's just sort of things like a, a thing to do. Um, so once that gained some steam, we then had a formal um, National Institutes of Health Consensus Development Conference uh, format that we adopted in 2008, four years later, when we had the meeting in Zurich, where we actually prepared a list of questions to be addressed in advance. There was background work done to search the literature before the meeting. Um, we had a formal open two-day session followed by a closed one-day debate and then produced a, a true consensus statement. So when people say, you know, the third consensus statement, it's actually the first consensus statement because the other one was a agreement statement. And then we did the same thing again in Zurich in 2012, um, more formal. We did full, a full systematic review, um, set of publications in advance. And the SCAT tools, the sport concussion assessment tools evolved with that. And much to our surprise, um, got a huge amount of attention. Um, there's a concussion recognition tool, the SCAT3 and the Child SCAT3. And the last count a few months ago, is this just downloading PDFs? These are not, not page views or we don't know how much people download it and copy it. I know our clinic copies it thousands of times from one download. So we've had 100,000 downloads. It's been translated in seven or nine languages now. Um, so pretty, pretty widely used. And we just had the last meeting um, most recent meeting in Berlin last month, 
um, where we brought together, again, the similar format to last time. That's a fairly structured thing. But it's been really fun to be part of a group of colleagues um, that um, really put a lot into this. And, and probably the most interesting thing is there's a huge amount of debate in this field. Some of it's a bit acrimonious. Um, but the best part of this is we were able to invite people who had completely opposite points of view. I think we only had two people who declined from the whole group we invited internationally. Um, so people with very different points of view came together and actually produced a consensus statement. So getting people with disparate points of view to agree on something I think is tremendously powerful because it's, it, it's meant to be something that produces a practical tool for the clinicians who have to manage these injuries. And hopefully also uh, draft a, a research agenda of the gaps in knowledge that we can then move the field forward by filling in those gaps. Um, Carolyn would have been in this picture. She didn't have her hip hop or did on four weeks ago, but there was a, even a, a national summit last week um, in Rideau Hall to try and address this and look at national policy in Canada. Um, there's, there's legislation that's come out in the US around concussion management. So this is a field that, that has a lot of attention. I'd, I'd say in a way almost too much. There's a bit of hysteria around it. Uh, but the good thing is that does help drive the research agenda as well. Uh, we've been part of a, a group of, of international centers. They started out with, with four that were sponsored by the IOC. Uh, starting in 2008, there's now nine. Um, and also I've been fortunate to be part of the Medical Commission Expert Group, which really has been formed out of the research center uh, group. Uh, and that has allowed me to participate in some fun things like working at the Olympic Games, doing injury surveillance, looking at ways of making sports safer, which is a much bigger problem. Um, in Vancouver, we had a death the first day in, in Luge, uh, a little bit less in the summer sports because they're not just this high velocity, hard trauma, uh, though there still is some uh, similar, uh, fairly significant spinal injuries in, in Sochi, especially with the new sports, with the slope style sports. Um, and then there was Rio, where everybody was afraid there'd be a huge public health problem, which actually never happened, which was great. Um, but dealing with both the injury and the illness side of things uh, in an international game setting has been challenging and, and fun. And this is the last project I just want to mention because I think it's interesting, Catherine touched on it. So the IOC has a, a diploma program in sport medicine they started three years ago. It's a two-year online program and then the conclusion is they have to come from wherever they are in the world to one of four places to have a, a three-day workshop. They have to have an in-person examination and do all the physical exam and practical um, stuff. And they also just launched a diploma in physiotherapy program last year. So it's just in its first year. So we've hosted that in Calgary the last two Aprils. We have uh, one coming up again that Mary Beth's organizing uh, in the spring for the, for the third time around. But the reason I think it's interesting is that we're doing this because we're a research center first. And that's how we're recognized. Um, and that we have a very tight connection with the sport medicine center and the clinicians there and through that do the education so it's the classic three pillars of the university right research teaching and service um, combined together and i think that the challenge for the future is is how do we do that better and how do we do more of it because we definitely have the research clinical integration happening with some of dr motati's clinical trials work we have it happening with some of our cohort studies we're doing with a thousand kids playing youth ice hockey, their injuries get seen in the clinic. But I think there's much more opportunity to integrate the clinical and the research side back to that first Preston window picture you saw. And that was kind of the vision at the beginning of the, of the Sport Medicine Center. And I think, I think we can do more of that. So I'll just finish with, with a few um, personal reflections um, after having been here for, for 26 years. Um, looking back, over, over that time, it's actually very surprising that um, I've been here that long, at least it is to me, because it doesn't feel that long. Um, although some people tell me I definitely look older. Um, so I'd say a, a couple of key principles. Um, number one, have fun. It's really important to take your work seriously, but don't take it yourself too seriously. Um, some of the things I do to have fun is photography. So most of the pictures you see are pictures I've taken uh, over the years. Um, and I love sports. Um, I love to travel, um, mountain biking in Moab is a good thing to do. Um, but one of the great things has been meeting a lot of fun colleagues over the year, the years that you see at the same conferences. Uh, this is 
jumping at the top of a mountain in Tromsø, Norway, about 12.30 in the morning, midnight sun on Midsummer's Night Eve. Um, so going to a conference is good fun, but hiking with people after midnight in the sunshine is a good thing too. Uh, you'll make many choices in terms of your career directions. Um, choose wisely um, in terms of what you, you do. I think sometimes we're so busy doing the things we do day to day, we don't necessarily think about the choices of, of, of direction as much on a big picture scale, uh, but I do think it's important. Uh, I've been very fortunate, I'd say lucky, to have chosen to come to Calgary uh, to work with great people. And I mentioned the, the leaders that brought me here um, and it's been fantastic working with Carolyn, or your crutch, there you are, um, as uh, co-directors of our, our, of our co-chairs of our research center. Now, now Carolyn's taken that over um, and I'm totally confident she's gonna do an awesome job with that. Another good principle, I think, is to think long-term. A lot of the, the good things that I think have happened for me have been things I've invested in that have been not been short-term rewards. It's been things that really pay dividends much later, sometimes in ways you never expect. Um, so I'd encourage you to have a dream um, and pursue it with passion. Uh, one of the questions I'll often ask my students, as they know, is, so if there were no rules and no restrictions and you could forget about logistics and money and all the other things and you could just tell me what is it you want to do, most people can actually answer that question. And then the section, second question that I ask is, well, then why don't you do it? And often um, the perceived barriers are not as big as the real barriers. So I'd encourage you to whatever it is to pursue it because um, it'll lead to good things. Um, some of the things that have sort of fallen on my lap through the work that I've done are, are editing the journal, um, working with On the Podium and the Olympic Movement, um, now being part of the IOC expert group. But there weren't things that actually, that I said, oh, I want to do that and went after it. It sort of happened because of the research and because of the other things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. I think scientists and clinicians by nature are curious, so it's good to be curious, right? Don't forget to ask questions. Um, and don't be afraid to think differently about, about things. Don't be afraid to look at the same problem from a new perspective or a different way. Man's most valuable trait is a judicious sense of what not to believe. So question things, think differently and, and, and be curious. And uh, it's easy to get mired in things. There's a bunch of graduate students here I know who are probably feeling under the weight of things right now. Um, and everybody's so busy in the world we live in that Sometimes you can forget to be happy in what you do. And I know it's trite to say, but it's true. Uh, I've done some epidemiologic work and have calculated the mortality rate <laughs> amongst humans, and I found it to be 100%. So that's a really good reason to be happy. Uh, things that make me happy, um, reflection on a mountain lake is a good thing. Hiking a pass in this fall when the larches turn yellow is good traveling with my wife to strange places, um, having a glass of wine at sunset, a really good cup of coffee, <laughs> smelling the dew when you're running by a field in the morning uh, are all good things. So don't get bogged down in life. Keep your passion. Um, the things that make me passionate, I would say, would be first and foremost my family. Um, we've been blessed to have four great kids that you saw them wave at the beginning, you can say hi to them later. Um, we've traveled together. Um, one mistake I made is I waited 17 years to take my first sabbatical. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> uh, when we finally did and we took our kids and, and had a chance to visit a bunch of the training centers and other research centers was, was one of the best things we've done together as a family. Um, we like to be active together, cross-country skiing, much better than gravity skiing. <laughs> Uh, and now our family's starting to, to grow. Um, we have a son-in-law, a daughter-in-law, and, uh, and our passion for Mary Beth and I is we just love having our, our family together for dinners. We have an open house policy. They bring their friends. Sometimes their friends come without our kids, which is actually also okay. Um, and I'll close by saying be, be purposeful um, in what you pursue in your direction or your interest academically. Um, but also in getting the right balance in life. Um, that's one I haven't always done well. I could have done better on that one in terms of 
keeping a balance between your personal and, and professional life. When you're busy, it's easy to start giving up sleep and exercise and relationships, um, but not healthy in the long run. Uh, so find a way to pursue your passion purposefully um, with balance, I think is probably the, the important qualifier that, I, that I'll finish with. So I just want to say thank you to so many of you in this room that have been part of my career. You've been a fantastic set of colleagues to work with. Um, thank you, and thank you for staying awake for this, for this talk. Questions? Sure. I can take questions. Any questions? What's that? No. <laughs> On my hard drive. <laughs> Not on yeah. George Bernard Shaw's got the best ones. Yes. What um, made Medicine, because I was, I was just really interested in clinical care. Um, and uh, actually, my, my father's a veterinarian, and, and I liked what he did. He did large and small animal, drive around the country, operate on animals. Um, but he told me when I worked with him then that by the time I'd go through school, you couldn't do large and small animal. You'd have to specialize in one animal. So I thought one might as well be humans. So that was medicine. Um, and, uh, and I probably would have been voted the person in my medical school least likely to go to graduate school um, <laughs> because I just wanted to do clinical medicine and play. Um, but it was, it was getting this, this uh, bug of wanting to find answers to things and, and develop uh, new knowledge that made me want to pursue research. So that's how the two came together. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon.